Hi, in this class, let's talk about the Ehrenfest theorem. It's a theorem related to the time evolution of expectation values of operators. Let's see what it is. We have already learned different ways of describing time evolution in quantum mechanics. We can either work in the Schrodinger picture, in which the state gets evolve in time, or in the Heisenberg picture, in which the operators uh, change with time. But in both cases, to be able to use the time evolution equations or the equations of motion, we must first learn how to construct the appropriate Hamiltonian operator. We need to know the Hamiltonian operator for a given system so that we can use the equations of motion because Hamiltonian is the generator of time translation. So to describe time evolution, you need the Hamiltonian operator. Now, how do we find the correct Hamiltonian operator? This is an important question. There are certain tricks to do this. For example, in the case of a physical system with a classical analog, we can assume that the Hamiltonian has the same form as in classical physics. That is, we can take the classical Hamiltonian, which is in general a function of coordinates and momenta, and we can just assume that the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian is also the same function of Q and P. The only difference is that now we have to replace the Q and P in classical mechanics with the corresponding operators. So the procedure is simple. We take the classical mechanical Hamiltonian, replace Q and P in them with the corresponding operators, and then we assume that this process gives us the correct uh, operator, correct Hamiltonian operator in quantum mechanics. This method may not always work, but this is a good starting point. It can be shown that with this assumption, we can reproduce the correct classical equations in the classical limit. We know that quantum mechanics in the appropriate limit should give us the classical equations because classical mechanics is an approximation of quantum mechanics. Now, this method that we just mentioned satisfies this condition. But you may remember, you may note that the quantum theory obtained in this way is not the only theory that can reproduce the correct classical equations. This is just a method that works in most situations. Okay. Now, whenever an ambiguity arises because of non-commuting observables, we resolve this ambiguity by requiring that H has to be Hermitian. For example, suppose the classical mechanical equation or Hamiltonian has a term xp in it. Okay. But if we include this term in the quantum mechanical Hamiltonian, right, suppose we take H is equal to XP plus some other term. Right, suppose we have a term like this. But if we include such a term, then the Hamiltonian is no more Hermitian, right? Because H dagger would be P dagger X dagger, and X and P do not commute. So in general, H wouldn't be equal to H dagger. In such situation, we can resolve the ambiguity by requiring that the Hamiltonian has to be Hermitian. So instead of simply writing xp, we could do we could construct a combination half xp plus px. So the classical product xp has to be replaced by half xp plus px because now this combination is Hermitian, as you can check. Right? This combination is Hermitian. All right. So our method is to take the classical Hamiltonian and replace the position and momentum in the classical Hamiltonian by the corresponding operators and also ensure that the Hamiltonian thus obtained is Hermitian. All right. So this, this method gives us the correct quantum mechanical Hamiltonian in most cases. Okay. As we have already seen, there are physical systems with no classical analogs. In such cases, we can only guess the structure of the Hamiltonian operator. We have to resort to some sort of trial and error method where we try various forms for the Hamiltonian. We keep trying until we get the Hamiltonian that leads to results agreeing with empirical observations. If our guess is correct, then the predictions using that Hamiltonian will agree with the measurement outcomes or the results of measurement outcomes. All right. Let's now learn a couple of formulas uh, which will be useful later on. In many situations, we'll, we'll encounter commutators of this form, the commutator of an ith component of position operator with a function of the momentum operator or the uh, commutator of the ith component of momentum operator with a function of position operator, etc. Okay. 
There are two formulas to be used in such situations. The first is this, the commutator of xi, the ith component of the position operator with a function of the momentum operator is given by ih bar multiplied by the partial derivative of f with respect to the ith component of momentum. So if you look here, this is the ith component of position and the derivative is with respect to the ith component of momentum. And there's an ih bar that follows everywhere. So in order to find the commutator with the ith component of position, you just have to evaluate the partial derivative with respect to the ith component of momentum. It's easy to prove this. We can start with the fundamental commutation relation, the commutator of xi with pj. We know that this is ih bar delta ij. We immediately see that this can be written as ih bar partial derivative of pj with respect to pi because partial derivative of pj with respect to pi is delta ij. This is equal to 1 if i is equal to j. It's 0 if i is not equal to j. Let's now check the commutator of xi with pj square. This can be written as the commutator of xi with pj multiplied by pj. And then we can use this formula that we have already learned. The commutator of a with bc is equal to commutator of a with b multiplied by c plus b multiplied by commutator of a with c. So we can use that here and this becomes commutator of xi with pj multiplied by pj plus pj multiplied by commutator of xi with pj. And this is again the fundamental commutation relation. So we can write this as ih bar delta ij pj plus this is also ih bar delta ij. So we also have ih bar delta ij pj. And these two terms are the same. Remember there is no sum over j. Okay, Even though it is a repeated index, there is no sum over j in this expression. Okay, Because the j is fixed on the left side. If we take p1 here, if we take j equal to 1, then on the right hand side also j will be 1. All right, So the j is fixed from here. Whatever j appears here will be the same j as uh, uh, will be the same as that appears on the right side also. There's no sum over j. Now this is equal to, let me write it like this, uh, ih bar 2 pj delta ij, which now can also be written as a derivative. This is just the derivative of pj square with respect to pi. All right. This is easily checked. You see that the derivative of pj square with respect to pi is 2pj multiplied by partial derivative of pj with respect to pi, which is again 2pj delta ij. Okay, that's what we have here. So the commutator of xi with pj is ih bar partial derivative of pj with respect to pi. And the commutator of xi with pj square is ih bar derivative, partial derivative of pj square with respect to pi. Okay. So we see that in this case, taking the commutation, com taking the commutator with the ith component of uh, position, position operator, gives the derivative uh, with respect to the ith component of momentum. Now you can generalize this because you can, you can try also for the third term and you will see that you get exactly the same thing. So in general, we can write xi with pj raised to n, this is equal to i h bar partial derivative of p i raised to n with respect to sorry partial derivative of p j raised to n with respect to p i okay so this works you can try for the third term also this is just mathematical induction you can see that this relation works using mathematical induction so i leave it as an exercise for you to try x i with p j cube okay now, if you want to evaluate the commutator of xi with some function of pj, okay, or some function of momentum, let's say that this is a function of only one component of momentum, all right? Now, we can use the power series expansion. We say that this function uh, has a power series expansion. It's a properly behaved, a good kind of function, okay? So, this f of pj can be written as, I can write it as a power series expansion. Let me write a sum over n, a n 
pj raised to the power of n okay so we have the terms from n equal to 0 up to infinity all right now if i take xi with f of pj the commutator this gives us sum over n let me write it like this the commutator of xi with sum over n a n p j raised to n this can be written as sum over n a n which can be pulled out and then commutator of x i with p j raised to n but this we already know is i h bar partial derivative of p j raised to n with respect to p i so this is sum over n a n partial derivative of p j raised to n with respect to p i there's also an i h bar which i missed so let me write it a n multiplied by i h bar partial derivative of p j raised to n with respect to p i okay now we see that this derivative can be pulled out because these a n's are constants okay so let me write it here this thing becomes okay this is uh, partial derivative let me write i h bar partial derivative with respect to p i of sum over n a n p j raised to n now what is this this is exactly the power series expansion that we started with this is sum over n a n p j raised to n so we can write this as f so we have i h bar partial derivative of f with respect to uh, p i all right so we have found that the commutator of x i with some function of uh, p j is given as i h bar partial derivative of f of uh, p j with respect to p i okay now this should work for also for a function of a number of variables here we have included only one variable we called it p j all right this should work also for a function of number of variables for example if you have a function f of px comma py comma pz or in other words f of p vector right suppose you have a function f of p vector this is written as f of px comma py comma pz now this also has a power series expansion and in the power series expansion there will be zero order terms in px py and pz there will be first order terms in px py and pz there will be second order terms uh, of the form including px py some fun some uh, constant multiplied by px py some constant multiplied by py pz some constant multiplied by px square plus etc so there will be a number of second order terms similarly there will be a number of third order terms all right so each in each term there will be some power of px for example if you want to find the commutator with respect to x there will be some power of px some there will be some power of py there will be some power of pz so for each term we can use this formula commutator of xi with pj raised to n is equal to ih bar partial derivative with respect a partial derivative of p j raised to n with respect to p i all right so the idea is that you can write the power series expansion maybe you can write a few terms that that will be sufficient all right just uh, write the power series expansion all right now if you want to find the commutator of x i with f of p vector this will be the sum of the commutator with each of the terms in the power series expansion and each of the term is proportional to some pj raised to n all right so you can use this formula for each of the terms and then as we did in the previous case the derivative can be pulled out of the power series and then you are left with the power series expansion of f of p vector so in general we can write uh, commutator of x i with f of p vector is equal to i h bar partial derivative with respect to p i of f of p vector all right now i leave it as an exercise for you to practice right so you can try three variables like this you can take a few terms in the power series expansion and convince yourself that this actually works all right it's just a generalization of what we did in the case of f of pj all right in the same way it can be shown that the commutator of the ith component of the momentum operator with some function of the position operator is given by minus ih bar partial derivative of g with respect to xi all right so earlier we had commutator of xi with some function of p vector this is equal to ih bar multiplied by the derivative of f with respect to uh, pi 
right here we have commutator of pi with respect uh, pi with some function of x vector is minus ih bar and the derivative with respect to the ith component of position so here the commutator is uh, with uh, the ith component of position and the derivative is with respect to the ith component of momentum in this case the commutator is with the ith component of momentum and the derivative is with respect to the ith component of position okay and you see that there is an extra minus sign here right so we see that we get this expression by starting with our first expression and then replacing all xi with pi etc right so if you just replace x with p everywhere you get an expression of this form but this minus sign had it has to be added by hand so this also tells us the fact that if you take an expression and uh, replace all xi with pi and vice versa then there will be an extra minus sign this is easily seen from the commutation relation also xi with pj is equal to i h bar delta ij in, in this expression if you replace uh, all xi with pi and vice versa so suppose we have got pi with xj we know that you then also you get i h bar delta ij but with a minus sign okay the same thing we, we have seen also in the case of Poisson brackets. Now, you, you remember that these expressions that we have here look exactly like the Poisson bracket relations that we already had. Right? In the case of Poisson bracket, in classical mechanics, we had expressions like this. For example, if you have something like uh, Q with F of P vector, all right? the Poisson bracket, we know that this is equal to the partial derivative with respect to P of f of p vector all right so this Poisson bracket we see that this Poisson bracket relations look very similar to this commutation relations all right so here also we can get the this relation the relation that we obtained right now from the Poisson bracket relations you just substitute the Poisson bracket here by the corresponding commutator divided by ih bar okay that will give us this relation all right so it shouldn't be very difficult to remember these two formulas the commutator of xi with f of p vector is ih bar partial derivative of f with respect to pi and the commutator of pi with g of x vector is minus ih bar partial derivative of g with respect to xi okay now let's apply the heisenberg equation of motion to a free particle of mass m we don't know the hamiltonian so we look at the classical hamiltonian we know that for a free particle the classical hamiltonian has the form p square divided by 2m or we can write it in an expanded way like this it's p x square plus p y square plus p z square divided by 2m we assume that the quantum mechanical hamiltonian also has the same form all right so the hamiltonian operator in quantum mechanical case is now written as p x square plus p y square plus p z square divided by 2m all right remember that in the quantum mechanical case all these are operators okay so we have the Hamiltonian operator Px square plus operator Py square plus operator Pz square divided by 2m. Let's work in the Heisenberg picture, which means that these operators are all time dependent. So Px, in general, Pi, Xi, etc. depend on time. They evolve according to the Heisenberg equation of motion. We shall omit the superscript h for convenience. Earlier we used the superscript h for the Heisenberg picture operators. Let's omit that for convenience. Now let's find the equation of motion, the Heisenberg equation of motion for the observable pi. We know that we can find this as dpi by dt is equal to 1 divided by ih bar multiplied by the commutator of pi with the Hamiltonian. For example, if i is equal to 1, we are talking about this equation, dpx by dt is equal to 1 divided by ih bar, the commutator of px with the Hamiltonian. And what's the Hamiltonian? It's px square plus py square plus pz square divided by 2m. Okay. Now we know the fundamental commutation relations. x with px is ih bar, but px with px is equal to 0 px with py is also equal to 0 px with pz these are all zero which means that px here commutes with the hamiltonian in general any pi commutes with the hamiltonian so dpi by dt is equal to 
zero according to the Heisenberg equation of motion. So we have for any component of momentum, dPi by dt is equal to zero, which means that Pi does not change with time. In other words, for a free particle, the momentum operator is a constant of the motion. This means that Pi at any time t is the same as the Pi at t equal to zero. Now, looking at the Heisenberg equation of motion, it's clear that whenever an observable commutes with the Hamiltonian, whenever a Heisenberg picture observable commutes with the Hamiltonian, then that observable is a constant of the motion. Because if AH commutes with the Hamiltonian, this term is zero, and then we will have DAH by DT is equal to zero, which means that AH is a constant of the motion. We have actually seen something similar in the Schrodinger picture also. I think we already mentioned that whenever there is an observable that commutes with the Hamiltonian, we can call that observable a constant of the motion. There is a sense in which it is a constant of the motion. Right? So we have uh, said similar things when we discussed the Schrodinger picture also. Let's now find dxi by dt. We know that in the Heisenberg, according to the Heisenberg equation of motion, dxi by dt is simply 1 divided by ih bar the commutator of xi with the Hamiltonian. Now the Hamiltonian itself is px square plus py square plus pz square divided by 2m, which can be written compactly as 1 divided by 2m sum over j equal to 1 to 3 uh, pj squared. Okay, So this can be written as 1 divided by ih bar. This 1 by 2m can be pulled out, multiplied by 1 by 2m. And then commutator of xi with sum over j equal to 1 to 3 pj squared. Okay. Now we can use this relation. The commutator of xi with some function of p vector is obtained easily as ih bar multiplied by the partial derivative of f with respect to pi. All right. So here we have this becomes 1 divided by 2m ih bar and sum over j equal to 1 to 3. Let me write one more step. Commutator of xi with pj squared. Okay, so this is 1 divided by 2m ih bar. Now let's use this formula. So this commutator is given by there's a sum over j equal to 1 to 3. This commutator is ih bar multiplied by partial derivative of pj square with respect to pi. Okay, we know how to evaluate this. We see that the ih bar cancels here. So this is equal to 1 divided by 2m sum over j equal to 1 to 3. All right. The partial derivative of pj square with respect to pi is 2pj delta ij. Okay. Now you can carry out the sum over j. We know how to do the summation. You, you will get pi. The 2 also gets cancelled. So this is simply pi divided by m. Okay. So we, we get this result. This is equal to pi divided by m. Now we already noted that pi is a constant of the motion. So pi at any time is the same as pi of 0, which means that you can write this also as pi of 0. Okay. So here we have dxi by dt is equal to pi of 0 at, uh, sorry, pi at time t equal to 0 divided by the mass. Okay. Now we have the Heisenberg equation of motion for xi. We obtained it as dxi by dt is equal to pi of 0 divided by m. We can integrate this equation to get xi as a function of time. The integration is easy here. We can we just write dxi is equal to pi of 0 divided by m multiplied by t dt. Okay. Now you integrate on both sides and there would be a constant of integration. Let's write the constant of integration as c. So you get xi of t is equal to, we see that this pi of 0 divided by m is a constant. It can be pulled out of the integral. So this integral becomes pi of 0 divided by m uh, multiplied by integral dt. Integral dt is just t, okay, plus this constant of integration. Now we see that this constant of integration is the value, is the operator at time t equal to 0. To see this, you just put t equal to 0 here, you get xi of 0 is equal to c. 
okay which means that the constant of integration here is actually the operator the position operator at time t equal to 0 so finally you can write the solution xi of t is equal to the constant of integration xi of 0 plus pi of 0 divided by m multiplied by t now if you look at this solution this solution is exactly the same it has the same form as the classical trajectory equation for a free particle all right because in classical mechanics in newtonian mechanics for a free particle we have the force acting on the particle zero so you can write dpi dt is equal to zero okay in other words pi is a constant and this constant we can write it as the value of the momentum at time t equal to zero okay now we use the newtonian expression for pi this becomes m dxi by dt all right m dxi by dt the mv pi is mvi in newtonian mechanics so m dxi by dt is equal to constant which we denoted as pi of zero or dxi by dt is equal to pi of zero divided by m which is exactly the same equation that we had here so the solution is also the same okay now you remember that in this case this xi's are operator this pi are all operators here in the newtonian case they are not but the equations have exactly the same form the solutions also have the same form okay so we see that in the heisenberg picture the equations that we write down look very much like the corresponding classical equations in heisenberg picture when you write down the commutation relations you have to be really careful for example let's start in the schrodinger picture in the schrodinger picture we always have xi with xj commutator is equal to zero all right, the commutator between two components of the position operator is always zero. All right. Now, corresponding to this in the Heisenberg picture, we can write xi of zero with xj of zero. The commutator of xi of zero with xj of zero is equal to zero. All right, because the Schrodinger picture operator at any time is the same as the Heisenberg picture operator at time t equal to zero. All right. Now, this is correct. Now, in general, this works if the commutator is between two different components of the position operator at the same time okay so let me write commutator of xi of t with xj of t prime this is equal to zero if t is equal to t prime but it is in general not equal to zero if t is not equal to t prime all right so the equal time commutators of this form all right for example between different components of the position operator this is zero right equal time commutators but if the commutator is uh, between components of the position operator at different times this commutator need not be equal to zero all right we can immediately see an example here we already found xi of t is equal to pi of zero divided by m multiplied by t plus xi of zero right this is the solution that we got in the previous uh, slide all right now we can evaluate xi of t we can evaluate the commutator of xi of t with xi of zero here we are evaluating the commutator at different times all right now you can substitute for xi of t so this becomes pi of zero t divided by m plus xi of zero with xi of zero all right now we can separate this this is equal to pi let me write this is equal to pi of 0 with xi of 0 the commutator of pi of 0 with xi of 0 there's a t divided by m out here plus commutator of xi of 0 with xi of 0 itself now we know that this is equal to 0 but this thing is not equal to 0 specifically we know that the commutator between the ith component of momentum and the ith component of position is i h bar Right, so here it's in the opposite order so we should get minus ih bar this commutator is minus ih bar because already from the schrodinger picture we know that pi with xi at any time this is in the schrodinger picture okay this is equal to minus ih bar all right now this is true for the heisenberg picture commutator at time t equal to zero right because the heisenberg picture operators at time t equal to zero are the same as the schrodinger picture operators so we get this as this is equal to minus ih bar let me write it here minus ih bar t divided by m so here we see 
that xi of t, the commutator of xi of t with xi of 0 is not equal to 0. Okay. We have found that the commutator of xi of t with xi of 0 is not 0. It's in fact minus ih bar t divided by m. So this means that xi of t and xi of 0 are a pair of incompatible observables. And we know that when we have incompatible observables, there is a non-trivial uncertainty relation between them. And the generalized uncertainty relation that we learned in the first chapter is written as the expectation value of delta A square multiplied by the expectation value of delta B square is greater than or equal to 1 by 4 modulus square of the expectation value of the commutator of A and B. All right. So the first term here quantifies the uncertainty in the observable A and the second term quantifies the uncertainty of observable B. We know that we can write delta A square. The expectation value of delta A square is equal to the expectation value of A square minus the square of the expectation value of A. All right. This is what we call the dispersion or we said that this quantifies the uncertainty in observable A. So the product of uncertainties is greater than or equal to a minimum value, which is given by this. Now we can apply this generalized uncertainty relation to the case of xi of t and xi of 0. Right? And we see that the product of the dispersion at, of xi at time t and xi at time t equal to 0. Right? The product of these uncertainties is greater than or equal to h bar square t square divided by, divided by 4 m square. Right? So the right hand side is obtained from this relation. This is 1 by 4 modulus square of the expectation value of the commutator. And what's the commutator? It's minus i h bar t divided by m. Okay, there's a modulus square. So this is equal to 1 by 4 h bar square t square divided by m square. All right, so that's what we have here on the right side. So even if the uncertainty in position is zero at time t equal to zero, it becomes more and more uncertain. The position becomes more and more uncertain at, as time evolves. Right? In fact, as time increases, it becomes more and more uncertain. What we have learned is that even if the particle is well localized at time t equal to zero, its position becomes more and more uncertain with time. The same conclusion also can be seen in the Schrodinger picture. If we work with the Schrodinger picture, we can say the same thing, but the language will be slightly different because over there it's the states that evolve in time, not operators. All right? So even if you start with a well localized state, suppose you ma made a measurement of the position of a free particle, and we are fa fairly sure that it's around a particular point. All right? So this is a localized, this corresponds to the wave function for a localized particle or a localized wave function, because this means that the probability is uh, non-zero in a particular region and it's zero everywhere else. Now, even if you start with such a wave function, we'll see that later on the wave function will start spreading in space. Okay, so this wave function corresponds to a particle with a definite position, whereas this wave function, a spread out wave function, corresponds to a particle without any definite position. It becomes more and more spread out in space as time goes on. Okay, we have constructed the Heisenberg equation of motion for a free particle and we solved it. We also saw that the solution to the Heisenberg equation of motion for a free particle looks similar to the free particle solution in Newtonian mechanics. Now let's add a potential V of x vector to the free particle Hamiltonian. So the Hamiltonian now becomes h is equal to P vector square divided by 2m plus V of x vector. All right, so V of x vector has to be understood as a function of x, y, and z operators. Let's now look at the Heisenberg equation of motion in the case of a Hamiltonian of this form. Let's write down the Heisenberg equation of motion for pi and xi. Let's start with dpi by dt. Now, according to the Heisenberg equation of motion, this is equal to 1 divided by ih bar, the commutator of pi with h. Let's substitute for the Hamiltonian. We said that the Hamiltonian has the form. The Hamiltonian has the form px square plus py square plus pz square divided by 2m plus v of x vector. This is an equal time commutator. So the commutator of pi with px, py, pz, etc. are zero. So this is simply 1 divided by ih bar. The only non-zero commutator here is the commutator of pi 
with v of x vector. Now we can use the formula. We have a commutator of pi with v of x vector. We know that this is equal to uh, minus i h bar partial derivative with respect to x i of v of x vector. All right. We also have 1 by i h bar here. So the 1 by i h bar has to be put in here. This i h bar gets cancelled and we get d p i by d t is equal to minus partial derivative with respect to x i of v of x vector. Okay. In the same way, we can find dxi by dt using the Heisenberg equation of motion. dxi by dt is equal to 1 divided by ih bar, the commutator of xi with the Hamiltonian. And Hamiltonian is of the form px square plus py square plus pz square divided by 2m. Or let me write it compactly. Let me write this as sum over j pj square divided by 2m plus v of x vector. All right. Now, these are also equal time commutators. So, the commutator of xi with v of x vector is 0. So, this commutator just boils down to 1 divided by ih bar. Commutator of xi with sum over j, pj square divided by 2m. Now, this is something that we evaluated in the free particle case and it is equal to pi divided by m. So, dxi by dt is still pi divided by m. We have dxi by dt is equal to pi divided by m. Let's now find d square xi by d square xi by dt square. Right? This is d by dt of dxi by dt. Now, by the Heisenberg equation of motion, this is equal to the commit 1 by ih bar, 1 by ih bar, the commutator of dxi by dt with the Hamiltonian. Okay? But we already have dxi by dt. It's equal to pi divided by m. The 1 by m can be pulled out of the commutator. So let's write this as 1 by m, 1 by ih bar. All right. This is pi, commutator of pi with the Hamiltonian. We have just substituted dxi by dt is equal to pi divided by m. Okay. Now what is this? This is just dpi by dt according to the Heisenberg equation of motion because dpi by dt would be 1 by ih bar commutator of pi with h. So we can write this as this is equal to 1 by m dpi by dt. Okay. So we have d square xi by dt square is equal to 1 by m dpi by dt. Let's now combine the results. From the previous slide, we had d square xi by dt square is equal to 1 by m dpi by dt. All right. And earlier we had found that dpi by dt is equal to minus the partial derivative of v of x vector with respect to xi. All right. So combining this, we can write d square xi by dt square, d square xi by dt square is equal to 1 divided by m. And instead of dpi by dt, you can write minus partial derivative with respect to xi of v of x vector. Okay. We can multiply by m on both sides and we get m d square xi by dt square is equal to minus partial derivative of xi with uh, minus partial derivative with respect to xi of v of x vector. Okay. Now this equation is only for the ith component of the x operator. Okay. So that means that these are actually three equations, one for i equal to 1, the next for the i equal to 2, and then for i equal to 3. So together, these three equations can be written as a vector equation. We can write this as m d square x vector by dt square. We know that partial derivative with respect to xi is actually the ith component of this operator, del vector. All right, so this is m d square x vector by dt square is equal to minus del vector of v of x vector. Okay. So this looks exactly like the Newton's second law. So you can call this as the quantum mechanical analog of Newton's second law because this is the gradient of a potential which gives the force. Actually, the negative gradient of potential gives the force and this is actually the same as Newton's second law, f equal to m d square x vector by dt square. Now this is the result that we have. Right? We found that m d square x vector by dt square is equal to dp vector by dt, which is in turn equal to minus del vector v of x vector. 
Now let's take the expectation value on both sides with respect to some Heisenberg picture state kit. Let's right? suppose you are given a Heisenberg picture state kit. Let's take the expectation value of this operator equation. Remember that these are all operators. The x vector is the position operator, p vector is the momentum operator, and the x vector here is also the position operator. Okay. So if we take the expectation value, this equation becomes m d square expectation value of x vector by dt square is equal to d expectation value of p vector by dt, which is in turn equal to minus expectation value of del vector v of x vector. All right. And this equation is known as the Ehrenfest theorem. It's named after P. Ehrenfest, who derived it using the formalism of wave mechanics. Okay, you can derive it in the wave mechanics, you'll get the same result. Right? But here we derived it using the Heisenberg picture, the Heisenberg equation of motion. All right. So this equation is valid only in the Heisenberg picture. But once you take the expectation value, since the expectation values are the same in the Schrodinger picture and the Heisenberg picture, this equation is valid in both pictures. All right. The, the equation for the expectation value is valid in both pictures. So this can also be obtained from the using the Schrodinger picture. The same result can be derived using the Schrodinger picture also. In fact, it was first derived using the formalism of wave mechanics. Now, Ehrenfest theorem simply states that the expectation values of quantum mechanical operators obey the laws of, of classical mechanics. All right? So this is just the equation for classical mechanics. So we can say that the expectation values in quantum mechanics obey the laws of classical mechanics. Okay, so we had the Heisenberg equation of motion dA by dt in the Heisenberg picture for Heisenberg picture operator is equal to 1 divided by ih bar, the commutator of ah with the Hamiltonian. Okay, now we can actually take this is valid only in the Heisenberg picture, right? This equation is valid only in the Heisenberg picture because the operators evolve only in the Heisenberg picture, not in the Schrodinger picture, right? So this is only in Heisenberg picture only in Heisenberg picture. Okay, but if we take the expectation value on both sides with respect to a Heisenberg picture state, okay, this becomes d by dt of expectation value of ah is equal to 1 divided by ih bar, the expectation value of the commutator of ah with the Hamiltonian. All right, once we write it in terms of the expectation value, this is valid in both. This is valid in both. Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture. Okay. And the Ehrenfest theorem that we actually saw is, in fact, a special case of this equation. All right. This is this equation. We can call it the equation of uh, motion for the expectation value of an operator. This is valid in both Heisenberg and Schrodinger pictures. And the Ehrenfest theorem that we saw just now, it's actually a special case of this equation. All right. It's a special case where AH, the Heisenberg picture operator, is either the position operator or the momentum operator. All right. So if, if we have the position operator or the momentum operator in here, then this statement is called the Ehrenfest theorem. So it, you can think of it as a special case of a more general statement of this form. Okay. Now the Heisenberg equation of motion was dA by dt is equal to 1 by ih bar commutator of A with h. Here there is this h bar which actually shows that this is a quantum mechanics equation. This is an equation that has to do with the quantum mechanical system. But once we go to the expectation value of x vector and p vector, in this equation the ih bar has completely disappeared. So this looks just like a classical mechanical equation. In other words, Ehrenfest theorem actually tells us that the center of a wave packet actually moves like a classical particle that is subjected to v of x vector. Okay, we started with the Heisenberg equation of motion dA by dt is equal to 1 divided by ih bar commutator of A with h. This equation is valid only in the Heisenberg picture because operators are time dependent only in the Heisenberg picture. But if we take the expectation value on both sides, this equation is valid in both Heisenberg picture and Schrodinger picture because the expectation values are same in both pictures. All right. So this equation is valid both in Schrodinger picture and Heisenberg picture, whereas this picture is valid. This equation is valid only in the Heisenberg picture. And as a special case of this equation, we found that 
the equation of motion for expectation value of x and expectation value of p right we found that m d square expectation value of x by dt square is equal to d by dt of the expectation value of p vector which is equal to minus expectation value of del vector of v of x vector okay and this equation was called the Ehrenfest theorem and Ehrenfest theorem actually states that the quantum expectation values obey classical equations of motion all right so with that i shall conclude this session thank you